Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. And let me just say one thing about my background is my background is in mathematics and topology, geometry, group theory. So pen and paper mathematics, not CS related. So about five years ago, though I was interested in it from for much longer, I just on my own switched more or less to automated theorem proving as things that I work on, which is getting computers to do uh, mathematics. Uh, so it's a great, great pleasure to speak before a computer science student's audience. This is the first time I'm speaking before a primarily CS audience. So, and of course, uh, everything, all the code that is relevant, you'll find here and so elsewhere also. Okay, so what would I take as my goal in automated theorem proving? So I'll formulate it this way. We want to equip computers with all major capabilities used by mathematicians and mathematics community in discovering mathematics. Now computers are used in mathematics, but in generally in mathematics or any other fields, computers are good at certain things and not so good at others. Or rather they're very subhuman at some things and very superhuman at everything else. There's almost nothing at which computers and humans are equal. I mean, if today they're equal at something, within three years they'll be far ahead. So they're either, either far behind. And of course, people do make good use of computers where computers are stronger. And they make com things which computers are good at even better. I mean, you make them even better. But I'd rather say that I would focus, and I'm not the only one, on those things where capabilities are very much subhuman and see if they can be pushed up. So this would mean beyond experimentation, computation and enumeration. These are things for which computers have been used a lot, including in famous cases. The first famous case is four color problem around 1980 or so. Uh, more recent case, which is, uh, and computation here includes things like linear programming. More recent around the turn of the century, uh, famous case is what is called a Kepler conjecture. This is the same Kepler of uh, whom everybody has heard of. So one of the things Kepler conjectured, we would say in modern times, he observed, but had no proof of, was the most efficient way to pack spheres is the obvious hexagonal lattice. So a computer assisted proof by Tom Hales showed that this was the case. Now, one thing that one learns from especially DeepMind and Co is that you should invent measures if necessary. You should have objective measures when you're trying to do things. And if necessary, you invent them or you follow them because otherwise you'll keep arguing what is really a proof, what is this and what is that. So when I say equip them with a capability, if a computer lacks a capability today, one should have something measurable that the computer cannot do and so that you can target that. This even works within human systems. So my goal would be to not, I mean, what's the point of doing these things now? It's that there are lots of wonderful AI systems and lots of wonderful ideas that go into that and we know they work. And there's hardware good enough for them to make it work. So the goal is to make a bridge between what is needed to do mathematics and what already is done in vision and various other uh, fields, playing games especially. Uh, so AlphaGo being kind of the model of the best system to learn from. AlphaGo Zero, I should say, the, which I assume everybody here has heard of. OK. Uh, so what can computers do? So computers can do. Numerical computation, enumeration, symbolic algebra. This is all old hat. Also, some of these proofs use exact real number arithmetic. Okay, That is to say, you cannot calculate a real number. It has infinitely many places. But you can give an exact bound in terms of a rational number. And the rational number can be kept with arbitrarily many digits. So with that, you can prove results. And some of those I mentioned were done. Linear programming and also SAT solvers. And compact enumeration, I try to emphasize this with a mathematical audience, but I won't here. Because it's one thing that most mathematicians don't realize can already be used for things that they are working on and has been used in some instances, but they don't use it. But I won't get into that. So I mentioned there have been some important results. There's the four color theorem, the Kepler conjecture. Uh, this one I mentioned. This is an interesting one, which I don't know how many of you heard of this in the news? Did people hear of this? This was described as the world's longest proof. It was a 100 terabyte proof. So it's a basic, very natural uh, number theory problem, if you wish. It is that, so Pythagorean triples we all he have heard of. They are numbers like 3, 4, 5. Three integers, so that 3 squared plus 4 squared is 5 squared. 
So the question asked somewhere in the mid 80s, I forget by whom, maybe no, some well known number theorist, is the following, can you color the integers in two colors, red and blue, so that there is no Pythagorean triple, which is monochromatic, with all three being uh, of the same color. And indeed this was answered using a uh, linear programming tools and then a proof certificate was generated a few months ago. So the proof certificate itself was uh, extremely large, some 100 terabytes or something like that. This is a basic question in dynamics. This one is a very nice number theoretic result. Manjul Bhargava and a co-author uh, proved this. It says that if a quadratic form, which is something of the form x squared minus xy plus y squared, you take a quadratic form, it's clear, like quadratic equation, and suppose it's integral, that is, whatever integers you put in as input, you get an output which is an integer, if all the xi's are integers. This happens if it has integer coefficients, but it sometimes happens anyway. Suppose an integral quadratic form takes the values 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 290, then it takes every value. This is a very striking statement. Again, this proof involved a significant computer assistance. Okay, but I'm going to focus on a less well-known result. So what I'll do is I'll have a little talk within a talk as a kind of case study, and then we will focus on the larger questions and so on. Okay, but it has some useful features to learn from. Okay. So this was the talk within the talk. This is the title I give it if I give it a talk itself. Homogeneous length functions on group, uh, polymath adventure, as I said. I'll try to give impression of what there is, and it's the story that matters more, and I'll say something about the code, rather than the mathematical details, which anyway I have pruned to some extent. Okay, so polymath is a way of massively collaborating maths. This was not a polymath, but what was called a spontaneous polymath, as we will see. And this is the list of people who are now considered authors of this polymath thing. Uh, you see there, one in Europe, only institute which has two is this institute, and both of us are from the maths department. And I think only two who are less than a thousand kilometers apart even. Okay. So I'll start with the story of this, and why, uh, and then get back, get around to more general questions. Okay. So on Saturday, December 16, 2017, as I recollect, Terence Tao posted on his blog a question which Apurva Khare had asked him. How many of you have heard of Terence Tao? I think about half of you have. He's a phenomenal mathematician, he's not just a Fields medalist. He's one of the best mathematicians around. He's uh, quite young, in his 40s still, uh, but extremely famous since, I think, age 12, he became the youngest to get an Olympiad gold medal. Uh, but he's also very, very famous for the lot of important mathematics he has done. Apurva Khare has collaborated with Terence Tao. Apurva Khare is in the maths department of IISC. For, uh, he has been for about the last year or so, but he was visiting the US, in particular he was visiting Terry Tao and he asked him a question. The details of this question are not important. It's, is there a homogeneous conjugacy invariant length function on the free groups on two generators? I'll give you some idea what the question is in a minute. Six days later, this was answered with a collaboration involving uh, several mathematicians. I've listed them. Uh, there are also many unlisted who made smaller contributions. It's an honor system, what is considered a substantial contribution and what is not. Several mathematicians and a computer. I'm talking about it here for the reason of computers. Uh, by the way, it wasn't a fancy computer. It's a laptop sitting right there, my Vio, which is uh, not especially powerful machine. Unfortunately, it's sitting there because I upgraded OS and could not uh, connect it to the port after that. So this is the story of, it, of the answer and its discovery. So let me give some idea of the mathematics behind it, as I say. We'll fix a group. Do people know what groups are? Okay, can I assume people? Okay, so we fix a group. So if you don't know what a group is, you can think of invertible matrices. So you can multiply them, but AB is not BA. Okay. In the late 1800s, this was a remarkable discovery that there are interesting objects where you can multiply them, but AB is not BA. But long time has passed since then. Okay, so it's a group uh, uh, so with inverses. A length function, you want to tell what the length of an element is, but there's no unique way in general on a group. There are different notions of length. So length has the certain properties. Length of identity is just zero. And it's symmetric. Length of an inverse is length of the element. You can think of integers with addition even. Length of zero is zero, 
integers is negative. And the key point is that the length of the two sides of a triangle is less than or equal to the third side. So this is the length of the edge. So I call this a pseudo length function. Length function has the additional property such that whenever g is not 0, its length is not 0. So the only element with length 0 is uh, which is distance 0 from the identity is the identity itself. The reason I have separated this, this is typical in mathematics, it's very difficult to talk about an empty set of objects. So we were talking about a homogeneous length, is there a homogeneous length function? If there isn't, all your statements you are making is about an empty set. It's better to say that we are talking about this non-empty set of objects, also pseudo length functions, and ask if any of them have the additional property of being positive. Okay. There are many other versions of this. You can drop some properties and ask if they have an additional property. Because then you can experiment and understand a non-empty set of objects. You're understanding something and which exists and then trying to understand if it also can have some other property. So, so in particular, everything here would start with pseudo lengths and ask if you can actually have positivity. Okay. So the two other terms, it's conjugacy invariant. You would have seen conjugate matrices. If the length of gh, g inverse is length of h. And it's homogeneous if length of g to the n is n times the length of g. Okay. This is from a geometric group theory viewpoint, which is how I would first look at this thing. An unusual property. But indeed, uh, Apurva asked it because in another context, it's natural. You'd all have seen a norm on a vector space has this kind of property. Except that you won't write it as a power, you'll write it as product. Okay, you think of vector spaces with addition, norms of course are homogeneous. Okay, so here's an example. Let's look at group pairs of integers with addition. Uh, conjugacy invariant homogeneous length function is given by uh, just mod a plus mod b. I could also take square root of mod a squared plus mod b squared. I could take maximum of mod a mod b. Uh, there are plenty of other of these. All of these are conjugacy invariant. Here is one. Okay, so here I should mention a free group. So free object, which free objects are also very popular in functional programming these days, is one which satisfies only what it really needs to satisfy. Everything else is there. So it's a group which contains alpha and beta, and we can say nothing more. That is the idea of free object. We don't put any constraints. Only things that are true are those that are forced by it. So it has, we'll consider words in four letters, alpha, beta, alpha bar, and beta bar. The bars are inverses. When you deal with them a lot, putting inverses on top becomes confusing. So you're forced to put bars on top. So because it's a group, it's forced to have inverses for alpha, beta. So that's all we start with. But we can also multiply them, right? So there are words in these. And you multiply words by concatenation. That is, you put them one after the other. Okay, this is like in German, you can have a word like Johann Wolfgang Goethe Strasse by just putting four words together. You normally can't do this in English or most languages. Yeah. But so you multiply words by putting them together. And we will regard two words as equal if we can cancel inverses. So here we have beta and beta bar got cancelled. So we have okay. So this gives a group. For example, alpha beta bar, alpha beta beta inverse. Yeah. So it gives a group, meaning each element has an inverse. That is the only thing we can see. And this is again something everyone would have seen while inverting matrices. What do you do? You reverse the order and invert each guy. But also remember that if I had a beta bar, it becomes a beta here because the inverse of the inverse is the group element itself. Okay, so this is the basically a group where we have alpha, beta, and only things that are forced on us by the fact that it's a group and it has alpha and beta, both in terms of what there is and what relations they satisfy. Okay. So if I ignore the orders of an element in a G, then I'll get something of the form alpha k beta to the L. Okay. For example, alpha beta beta alpha beta bar is the same as alpha squared beta. And so I can think of this as a pair of integers. That's all. And so I can define the length using the length on z squared. Okay. So this is a general mathematical idea. You can pull back with a quotient, one would say, but you can ignore this if it's uh, slightly subtle. Okay. So the thing is there are pseudo length functions. And the way I get a pseudo length function is I had one on z squared, pairs of integers. And then if I ignore order in the free group, all I get is z squared. So I use that pseudo length function. But it's not a length function because if I had alpha, beta, alpha bar, beta bar, that goes to 0, 0. So it has length 0. So it violates positivity. We have pseudo lengths, but they violate positivity. Okay, so this was the uh, question. 
So what was the polymath result? Now that all the terms are defined, let me recall. Is there a homogeneous length function on the free group on two generators? Okay, this time I didn't put conjugacy invariant. I'll tell you why I could or may or may not put. In fact, the answer was no in, as was discovered in six days of you know, fast activity on three continents. Uh, in fact, they all homogeneous length come, functions come from abelian groups. The details of this statement, if you're interested in mathematics, is interesting. Um, but otherwise, I'll, as I said, it's mainly the story that I'll focus on for these talks. So the nice thing is not only did we answer what seemed like an arbitrary function, question with a no, but we have what you would call a structure theorem. We know what are all the homogeneous pseudo length functions. There are obvious constructions on abelian groups. You can construct other ones by taking from the abelian quotient where you ignore the order change. And these are all of them. So we have a complete answer to this. Uh, this is now a paper recently published. I mean, it's accepted for publication maybe two, three weeks ago. So this was done in December. There were a couple of steps after that. Okay, so I'm going to tell the story. The first step. Almost immediately after this was posted, Tobias Fritz observed that homogeneous implies conjugacy invariant. If you forgot what they are, you don't do it. Within hardly an hour of it here, the poster. So all this happened on the blog of Terry Tau where he posted this question. So it, in the comments. So one of the points about this is that really as tooling goes, it's horrible. A WordPress blog is actually a horrible way to collaboratively work on mathematics. In spite of that, things worked extremely well. Okay. But Terry Tau chose it because if you create a barrier by having a better way, it drives away a lot of people. So you have, so I guess this was being inclusive, inclusive of, of people being uh, software impaired rather than any more physical impairment. But it was a good pragmatic choice in general. So homogeneous implies conjugacy invariant, Fritz observed. And the other thing Terry Tau observed, though Apurva had mentioned it in a paper a year earlier, was that I had this homogeneous condition. It's enough to look at, require that length of g squared is twice length of g. This will imply with the other properties, uh, the other things. It's a nice little proof. It will give you a very good flavor. But since this is not my central theme, I'll skip this proof. These two proofs give a very good flavor if one wants to understand the mathematics of it. But I will skip those for now. OK, so now let's go to the main thing. We started off on this question, posted on it. And we didn't know if it was true or false. We meaning each individual person involved. So people would try on one side and try on the other side, etc. And variations of this. So my own personal uh, thing, uh, uh, sorry, I started on Saturday. I saw this in Terry Tao's blog because I have subscribed. I get it in my Gmail, this question. I thought this is very interesting, but such a simple question must have a well-known answer, yes or no. So I decided I will wait till Monday for somebody to say yes or no. And I'll start thinking about it only on Monday if it it's clear that there isn't a well-known answer. So, so I, I started on Monday. So there was, meanwhile, a few things had accumulated. Various people started at various times. In particular, it became clear after a couple of days in the modern era that this wasn't a well-known uh, thing. So we could try to prove there is no homogeneous length function. Well, there are pseudo length functions. You want to show they fail positivity. So you want to show the length of some element is 0. That's what would do it. So you find bounds to contradict positivity. That would be an attack in one direction. So we'll fix a homogeneous pseudo length function and try to find bounds. Now the triangle inequality gives you a bound on LFGH if you knew the bound on LFG and LFH, okay, in terms of it. Homogeneity gives you a bound on LFGN if you had a bound on a power, okay. So using these, you could try to find bounds in terms of bounds for other elements. So specifically, this commutator symbol x, y, which will come is x, y, x inverse, y inverse. Okay, So this is the notation for it. You want to bound length of the commutator x, y in terms of L of x and L of y. By the way, those of us who knew mathematics, which is everybody on these, had the instinct that the thing to target is x, y. We try to show length of x, y must be small, ideally 0. Okay, This was more or less understood and uh, independently by everyone because, uh, well, we do mathematics. We know these things. Okay. Also, you would fix the lengths of the generator as 1, and you want to bound L of G for some G. Okay, so, so these are the two things. Also, this was something I wasn't involved in, but played a major role in the final proof. If you have a bunch of bounds, you want to combine them. And one nice way is you construct a function and show that it is convex. You can construct a range of functions. So this becomes a sort of meta way 
of going from individual bounds to a method of uh, finding strong ones, which is you interpret bounds in some sort of forms of convexity and so on. A version of this played a crucial role in the final proof. Now, on the other hand, we don't know if it's true. Yeah, go ahead. This one or the one before? This? Huh. Length one. Huh. That's right. That's not good enough though. So, so what we want to do is we want to say that some element has length zero. So when you fix the length as one, you immediately get a bunch of bounds on all elements. Okay. But those bounds don't prove anything. I mean, they don't answer the question positively or they answer the question negatively. What we want to do is, but thanks a lot for the question, we uh, want to contradict positivity. So we want to say that some word has length at zero actually. Or at least we want to keep improving bounds and get things. So the immediate bounds are not good enough to drive you down to zero. Okay. So that's why we want to work on the other side. Yeah, any other questions? So this was one direction. And as happens in many cases, we don't know if it's true or not. So it would be pragmatic to also try to construct things. Okay, This is like, as I learned uh, recently, now you have GANs, right? Generative adversarial networks. In general, adversarial things are very good. That you, One person is trying to construct bounds, and another person is trying to prove they're wrong. The difference here is that only one side has even a chance of winning, because it's a fact of nature that either there is a homogeneous length function, or there isn't one. And if there isn't one, however clever you are, you will not manage to succeed. Of course, both sides could lose. But uh, the, on the other hand, the positive side, you can switch sides as long as, as many times as you like, which all of us did, of course, based on the winning side. You can, so you can always try to jump to the winning side. But that said, and indeed, this worked very well adversarially because the constructions and the bounds were intimately tied up with each other. So we can attempt to construct pseudo lengths. Okay, uh, that are positive, or at least such that length of alpha beta is uh, positive. Again, I told you general principle said that if we could construct one where length of alpha beta is greater than zero, most likely using a sophisticated form of induction, you could actually construct a positive one. Okay? This was the instinct of people, uh, many, okay, including myself at that point. Turned out to be true in one sense, we could not do this, so we couldn't do the other, So, but still. Another thing is consider quotients larger than z squared. If you don't understand uh, this, ignore it. Uh, Savin, who didn't get listed there, Silberman, Terry Tau, all of them tried these and showed that you can't do some such constructions. This proved to be important later, that's why I mentioned it, but ignorable. There were also attempted constructions based on functional analysis, especially by Terry Tau, but these actually had no role in the final solution. So these can be ignored. There is another general method. These are very nice constructions, but I won't get into these. There are two constructions called hom homogenization and Kobayashi construction, which many of us knew. So the idea was you start with something that doesn't quite work and you try to improve it so that it works. And there are known ways in other contexts of improving it. So these were uh, things that we were all trying. This is just part of the story. So let me now turn to what I was trying to do it. I hope to combine this with an approach based on non-crossing matchings. And let me show you what I mean by non-crossing matchings. Okay? So a picture is worth a thousand words, I hope. So it's quite clear here what is a non-crossing matching, right? I have my alphas, A's and B's became alphas, uh, sorry, alphas and betas became A's and B's, just because it was easier for me to generate this word, picture. Given a word in F2, we consider matchings such that letters are paired with their inverses. A is goes to A bar, B bar to B. And no crossing. It's obvious what this is. There are no crossing. And you try to minimize it. You try to make this match as many as possible. There are lots of non-crossing matchings. Try to find the best one. Best one will mean, so in this case, one, two, three, and four letters are unpaired. Actually, for this word, four is the best. You cannot find a non-crossing matching with less than four okay. in this particular word. word. So there are many examples. So, you, so this is a typical uh, uh, question. So we define for G in F2, we define the Watson-Crick length LWC of G to be the minimum number of unmatched letters over all non-crossing matching. 
Now you may of course wonder where the word Watson, if one sees Watson and Crick together, you know what one is talking about, right? Well, you might think DNA, but actually it was RNA, close enough, that one is talking about. So the uh, reason I call this LWC is about a decade ago when I was dabbling in RNA folding. This turns out, non-crossing matching, turned out to be a very good model of RNA folding. Okay. I stopped dabbling in it for other reasons, which I won't get into here. And so I was using algebraic topology to study RNA foldings and so on. But that's a separate story. But so this was familiar to me and some of the important properties were familiar to me for a long time. Uh, namely this, it's unchained under cancellation. So if I cancel two letters, it's a little combinatrix to show that the Watson number of minimum number of unmatched letters doesn't change. And also it's conjugacy invariant. So it looks as if this is a good candidate to go ahead. Okay. It is, in fact, the maximal conjugacy invariant length. If you look at all conjugacy invariant lengths, this is bigger than all of them, or at least bigger than all of them. Okay. Not too difficult to prove. And as I said, I knew it for a decade because of other things that I was doing. However, it is not homogeneous. In fact, g squared is the word that was on that previous slide, which had length 4. But this one will have length 3. Okay. So indeed, I spent Monday trying to do this and trying to fix it. And on Tuesday morning, I uh, woke up and thought I better try some examples and found it violated homogeneity. Of course, this, by the way, this example was already on Terry Kao's blog. I mean, I, did, I, was, I was, one has to divide between working oneself and reading what others are doing. Better bounds than this thing were already there on the blog. I'm not saying the discovery of this bound was anything uh, particular uh, was any advance at all, but only personally it shot down this method as far as I was concerned. I tried to repair it and then realized that it doesn't. So what happened after this? So this is, as I said, I bring the story to Tuesday morning, starting on Monday. By Tuesday morning, most people were convinced that there are no homogeneous length functions on the table. But that's very far from being able to know, uh, have an idea to show there are no homogeneous Okay. And there was steady improvement in the combinatorial and analytical bounds on this length in particular. These seem to be stuck above 1. In fact, Apurva Khare observed. Again, these are general heuristics, one would call them, but human heuristics rather than software heuristics. There was a sense that if you could drive this bound below 1, you could drive it all the way down to 0. Or at least the nature says that it's zero. Doesn't mean our techniques are good enough. There are any number of mathematical questions where you expect something is zero and you only know how to show it's less than 0.73 or whatever else. Especially in number theory, there are many famous such questions. But the bounds were, if it was to be stuck somewhere in nature, not just in terms of what we can prove, then it's likely it would be stuck above one. But then eventually it broke this barrier. So everybody else was involved in this great bound chase, as I called it. At this stage, my approach diverged because I realized my comparative advantage didn't lay in following this uh, uh, approach. Once I moved away from geometric group theory to this kind of combinatrix analysis, after all, the world's best analyst is probably Terry Tao, who's one of those. So it doesn't make sense to try to be doing analysis. Also, perhaps the best combinatorist. So, uh, so anyway, I diverged from this to computer-assisted proving. That's why I'm talking about this here. So I'll come to these in more detail. But we can recursively count the matching length for this. It's a recursive procedure. This gives an upper bound for all bound on all conjugacy invariant normalized lengths. And we can combine it with homogeneity. Okay. Using this, I obtain an upper bound of about 0 0.85 on length of this. Incidentally, this was the first one that broke this are better broke that one barrier, but that turned out to be unimportant because Tobias Fritz bro broke the barrier by pen and paper also. The barrier being broken was unimportant. I obtained this bound. So I'll just say one technical point here. So as I said, Tuesday after giving up, I was writing the code to try to compute this and get a bound. Again, uh, things were working so-so. Wednesday morning, I realized the only one small technical improvement I made, and then immediately the bounds improved. So if you do write code in a, this, I just mentioned this technical improvement, most of you do, which is that I was not memoizing, I started memoizing in the sense that, so this is a recursive procedure, and I'm bounding the same word again and again. The first time around, 
every time i bounded the length of a word i recalculated and uh, uh, wednesday morning i realized this is the great inefficiency once i calculate a bound i should remember it which happened and then suddenly the bound started but this wasn't much use so then i upgraded it to at least a computer checkable proof with the idea that if a good proof comes i should have a proof certificate but the this was all on wednesday and thursday morning after figuring out how to do it i posted an in principle computer human readable proof of about here it is it's good i posted it saying gross proof time let me see how do i scroll on this computer is this a touch screen or no i'm uh... hmm oh okay 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 correct that's how i scroll down Sorry, I, I lost the scroll bar because of the. So here goes the computer proof. Gross, like Calvin and Hobbes saying, Calvin saying, gross. So I posted this saying, here is a gross proof uh, that a computer found. I hope someone who's cleverer than me can make good use of it. So here's a computer generated bound. And this is, of course, a completely human readable formal proof. It starts with the assumption that the generators have length less than or equal to one. This is using conjugacy invariant. This is using conjugacy invariant. Here and there, you will see the lengths of uh, uses of triangle inequality and homogeneity. In particular, the last step has a use of homogeneity using this and this. And finally, I get a b a bar b bar is less than 0.81. Oh, that's even better than 85. Using this is less than this, and taking 17 power is homogeneity. This one was a use of uh, triangle inequality, et cetera, et cetera. So this was a, a proof that was posted in principle human readable. I'll come to what, what it was internally and how it was posted. Can you guess how it was, how did I make this readable? Any guesses? Huh? Sorry? No, no, how did I render it in a readable form? Not how did I discover the proof? I'm asking a very simple question, not the deeper question of how it was found. Well, okay, so the thing is that I just use Unicode here. So it was Unicode can show you a bar, b bar, and mod, and less than or equal to, and so and so. I'm just a comment since <laughs> used to it. If you want to show things with mathematics on the web, easiest way to do it is generate Unicode. Let's say. So what happened here? This was Thursday morning. I posted it Thursday morning India time. By the way, we are all in different time zones. So when I uh, say this thing. Uh, in fact, in principle, I was the in practice, I was the only one in uh, Indian time zone because Apurva Khare was in Bangalore then, but he had just returned from the US and he was so jet lagged that he wasn't actually in Bangalore time zone. So I put it up and Pace Nielsen studied it. A few people commented on it. And quite amazingly, he started writing descriptions after saying, oh, this proof is really nice and so on. In line so and so to so and so, the computer used this method and so and so and extracted from this what he called the internal repetition trick. So it was not only in principle human readable, in practice it was human readable, and humans couldn't just read it to check it, but actually understood the proof. At least one human could. Okay, so constructive proof that it was human readable. I didn't construct the human being, and the human being did read it. And then what happened is Nielsen kept extending it. Tobias Fritz was the first one who understood what was going on, made variations of the method and started getting better and better bounds down to 0.5 and so on. And then Terry Tao realized that some this method is working very well and started asking Nielsen and uh, Fritz questions and uh, understood what happened. He put this in a very general form. And then Fritz put a special case of that general form and got the key lemma. This was the key lemma. We look at words of the form x to the m, x y to the k. And if you call that a function, then f of mk is less than or equal to this one. So this was the Fritz lemma, which was the key point. A probabilistic argument of Terry Tau finished the proof. So this all happened in Thursday. I was completely out of it because I was focused on getting better computer proofs. Meanwhile, uh, and I had not uh, studied even the internal repetition trick. And so meanwhile, Terry Tau and uh, Nielsen and Fritz uh, did this. When it was put in this form, Apurva says that Terry Tau commented, oh, now it's going to be a heat kernel argument. And then so Apurva told his wife, Terry Tau said heat kernel, I can go to sleep. It will be solved by tomorrow morning. Indeed, it was solved by uh, 
the next morning, but it turned out it was a probabilistic argument. So let me just say why this is. You can interpret this in the following way. Take 1 or minus 1 with uh, probability uh, half, with half your probability. Then you can think of f of mk as being average, less than or equal to average of f of m k minus half plus y times this. Okay. Details of this expression don't matter. Two things matter. You see here there is an average downward drift. So if you start above the origin, you are saying the right hand side on an average is going downward. Okay. Plus there is a random factor and we know that when you have random going left and right with drunkards, walks and whatnot, lots of cancellation happens. So the second term, lots of cancellation happens. First term is a net downward drift. So use this starting at 0, n, you go downwards, you get a bunch of bounds and then you use Shebyshev inequality or there are two, three different ways for Shebyshev inequality. So this is a beautiful probabilistic argument which finished. Okay, so now let me sort of reflect on this. This was the end of the polymath story. And uh, so as I said, first time I'm talking to a computer science audience. So I, even with mathematicians, I say the code and I show the code and just uh, try to tell them don't get scared of it. But here I will try to actually explain something that is going on. Okay. So first, what was this recursive method? Let me just uh, explain it briefly. If G, a word is of the form X times H, X is just the first letter, H is the rest of the word. Okay, then the length, remember it's a minimum of all non-crossing matrix. So there are two cases, either X is paired with, X is matched with something or it's not matched with something. If it is not matched, then it's, you look at the length of all the matchings which are among H, everything else, and then add one, which is X, X was lonely, right? And the key thing is that if X is matched, so H is U X bar V, X is matched to X in X bar. Non-crossing means no letter in U can be matched to a letter in V. Otherwise, you get a crossing. So you must have matches within U and matches within V. This is how the recursive thing, when uh, uh, one realizes this, it's just a matter of five minutes, as I said, to uh, write down a, a program which will compute this. And the only technical idea is that you're computing the same word again and again, memoize. Other than that, it's obvious what you have to do with the code. And more experienced people may do that straight away. That was the only non-obvious thing to me. Okay. So, but the point is that this will not only give you a number, it will actually give you the non-crossing matching. Don't just take the minimum as a number. Remember what the uh, matching was which gave the minimum. In this case, it's the matching with completely in H. In this case, it's the matching in U, matching in V, and add the pair X, X. So you can actually get it. And indeed, it gives a proof on the bound for a homogeneous thing. What do I mean by this? This is what I will explain. Okay. So here is the where modern ideas in automated theorem proving what's called homotopy type theory played a major role. So they played a role in an interesting way. None of the code that I had been working on and formally none of the ideas were involved in this, but the philosophy was very heavily based on that. So it's at a sort of conceptual level, it is crucially based on homotopy type theory and such advances and all that I had been working on. But at a level of actual code and literally, it, it didn't matter. So this is true in general when you're using mathematics. It's not that you use a theorem or method, you do sometimes, but it's a way of thinking which is really the greatest power. So it's really at the way of thinking that this used the entire sophistication of modern uh, formal and automated theorem proving at the way of literal code and something, almost nothing, it's self-contained, I'll show this. So by the way, we can also use homogeneity for selected elements to bound this. So what is the proof? Uh, does anyone recognize this language, by the way? Anyway, so the, huh? Haskell, no, it's actually not Haskell, it's Kala. If it was Haskell, it would look shorter. Okay, in fact, Haskell people always make fun of those who write in Scala because everything looks very verbose, but it's philosophically the same as the Haskell or construction, if you know Haskell, but in Scala, it has to become longer. Anyway, so this code is all in Scala, uh, which is a functional language which runs on the JVM. It's become very popular these days because of Apache Spark and various other such things. And I've noticed that it has suddenly become much more popular in India because you suddenly start seeing on Scala users many more questions from people in India, clearly. Uh, so what I did is the, so I did not prove in terms of set theory. 
and first order logic, which are the foundations. Instead, there was a code which represented proofs. And it represented proofs by having a sealed abstract class. You people would all see some Java somewhere, right? Some amount of Java. So these terms should be roughly similar. Uh, that So linear norm bound is what I called it. I'll explain what this is. So I defined a class which captured proofs of a certain kind. And I defined various subclasses which corresponded to the axioms of a homogeneous link. If people are interested, I can return to this. So let me just say what these are. So like a domain-specific language, which is a jazzy term in software, right? these are really domain-specific foundations. The foundations which work only in one little domain. So I defined a Scala type, which is a class and various subtypes. Objects are proofs of this bound, Okay, objects of this type. And the only way to construct such objects is to construct subclasses. That's why I sealed it and made it abstract. So the only way you can construct it is by your things that lie in the same file, technically. So proof is correct if and only if it compiles. Let me go back to this again. You see here, if I exclude this, this case power bound has a require here. If I exclude this, this case, and, and I can include the last one, everything is checked by a compiler. So if it compiles, it's valid. So the thing is that in it's that is kind of a holy grail that you want to encode everything in your language. Proof is co correct if and only if it type checks, that is, it compiles. So this is inspired by propositions as types. But of course, in Scala, which is not sufficiently advanced for this, I can't represent everything in compiler. Uh, I need to load, that is, run it to check proof using homogeneity. There was that required thing. But more importantly, uh, I, all that the compiler tells me is a valid proof. It doesn't tell me what word it is or what bound it is. So in that sense, to check what I have actually proved, also I need to run. So it does involve runtime. So let me just say, sir, make some comments on the computer proof. What I think are its merits. So our proofs and correctness are self-contained and separate from the act of finding the proofs. This is crucial. I mean, in some sense, formally this happens when you generate a proof certificate. But what a proof is and what a finding a proof should be completely independent acts. Almost anything non-trivial in this world is a sort of P versus NP instance. That is, verification should be much easier than discovery. So here, discovery and verification. I didn't show you the code implementing the recursion. But in terms of correctness of the proof, that is irrelevant. Okay. Hence, the correctness depended only on correctness of the code defining proofs, which was tiny. This is a general principle called De Bruyne principle in uh, automated and formal theorem proving that is everything should be correct provided a small kernel is correct. Everything else is in terms of these. And further, the proof was large, of course. By the way, I showed 130 lines. Internally, the proof was about 2,000 lines. It's just that there were duplication. I got rid of duplicates and got it. So the whole proof was presented. But if you look at the proof, which is a tree, the number of uh, leaves was more like 2,000. But I just dropped everything that was duplicate and ordered things and uh, and as I said, I mapped the classes to Unicode and put it up on the web. Okay, so search place was enormous. In fact, Silberman commented when this happened, how did you find the proof? Of course, in this case, this was algorithmic. It wasn't any smart procedure. Surely not searching for a ball of radius 500. And because these things involve exponential group, that is, if you're really searching for something like this, it's searching for 10 to the 30 cases or something like that. So, so the proof was enormous. But this means the proof had information content beyond establishing the truth of a statement. So in particular, one can learn from such a proof. So when you're talking about automated theorem proving, it becomes kind of clear as a sort of general philosophical issue that we will have to have uh, proof in mathematics has two roles. One is to check that something is correct. Two is to tell you why it's correct, but tell you why it's correct is a vague statement. Let me make it a precise statement. It's something from which you can learn to prove other things. Okay, so by, by having a useful reason. Now an enumerative proof has the weakness, not that this proof was that great either. An enumerative proof has the weakness that it convinces you something is correct. But there's nothing you can learn from it. Because you're not going to learn from the fact that I checked the million cases. Here it is in each of the million cases. This is also far inferior to a good human proof because it is 120 lines for a relatively simple uh, fact. But still, 
it had enough information content that Pace Nielsen could learn from it. So as you go ahead and talk about, so when I talk about capabilities of computers doing mathematics, they should not only be capable of generating proofs, but they should be capable of generating good proofs. And good proofs means a proof that you can learn from. Uh, so, so this is again, as I, this is a little way towards that. In some sense, little further towards that than the more famous instances of computer assisted mathematics. This is the only instance I know of actually where a human learned from a computer proof and then a human proof resulted. Uh, there must be other uh, things. Uh, of course, people do learn by experimentation, but not actual proof. But this had some serious limitations. First of all, elements for which I applied homogeneity were selected by hand. Uh, this is not a serious thing. Uh, thing. It's very easy nowadays with whatever machine learning or even some simple heuristics to overcome this. You saw the pace of this event. Thursday I generated this. On Friday I would have started trying smarter ways of doing it, but the problem was solved. So this is not the serious thing. But more importantly, the only proofs I could represent were bounds on concrete group elements. So as a result, we could not have expression inequalities and you couldn't use induction. Induction is crucial. So just as a proof of concept, uh, a little uh, few days afterwards, this was about first 10 to 12 days of work in early January, December, all this happened. I just formalized this in my own foundations, which were implemented. Uh, you'll find this on the web. So. Here is the formal version of the main lemma, not the probabilistic argument, but the internal repetition trick. This is all homotopy type theory using Scala, and I won't say details about it. So I just wanted to say that we can, a computer can at least represent the full proof of the main combinatorial lemma, even if it didn't discover it. So in fact, this was a useful exercise for me because more of the work I did was improving my foundations to make it easy to prove this rather than actually proving it, but that is a gain for uh, everything. Okay, so now let me uh, turn to a little more speculation in a five minutes. So what about discovering proofs? We discovered a small proof. What about discovering the more interesting proof? First thing that I should say for completeness is if I can represent a proof, I can discover it in principle. Namely, you just write down all candidate proofs and check, does this work, does this work, does this work, okay? So it's really just a tree search. Of course, this proof was a bit too long to find by a tree search like that, but it was not so gross with the proof that I've given, but this is still beyond reach. But in practice, you're going to have an explosion. Trees grow very fast, unless you're selective in what branches you go down to, okay? So in mathematics, a good way of finding uh, which branch to follow is look for intermediate results, which we'll call lemmas in mathematics, which are already interesting. So you follow something and then you see, oh, this is an interesting result. Let's try to use this further. Okay, so this is a good way. So I'm just going to consider a baby example problem to see, uh, to interpret this philosophy. Okay? Uh, I have to go far beyond the baby. But, uh, so let's see, you have all seen groups. So one of the baby things you see when you see groups is if you have a left identity and a right identity, then the left identity is equal to the right identity. Okay? So this is a baby version of it. And at least the baby version of it, if I, uh, uh, assuming that the internet works here, ah, yeah, it does. I can ask a server for proof. So uh, my code will start searching for it. By the way, as soon as I started, the browser starts searching for it. Okay, the server is a lot faster, but the browser takes about three minutes. It's because memory on a browser is much less. So Scala has, a, like many languages today, the attractive feature of being able to compile to JavaScript. So I use the same code running both on the server and in the browser. Now if, the, if I keep this page open long enough, suddenly you'll get an answer from the browser also with the same proof. But uh, that's not the point. Point is it queries the server and the server sends back a server sent event with the proof. And the proof indeed follows this philosophy. I mean, it's designed to, it discovers. So the proof itself is quite complicated because even though it looks like a simple statement, I have to apply correctly two different lemma axioms. Then I have to use symmetry of equality and then I have to use transitivity of equality. So if you think of literally searching, this is very, very long, okay? So the total weight of this is very small. However, along the way, there are a couple of lemmas which are weaker versions of this, like EL star ER is EL. And using some appropriate criteria, I can tell that they're interesting statements. 
Okay. So here's the underlying theory. I don't have much time, so I will more or less uh, skip all of this. I'll just tell you what I have not explained. I have not explained the philosophy behind the domain specific foundations. Okay. What we mean by formalized proof, I just showed you a bunch of code. And what I mean by good lemma. Okay. So these are all based on homotopy type theoretic foundations of mathematics. So this is, uh, I don't know how long I should go on. Okay, I'll just go on for a couple of minutes. I'll just say what, so because you people know programming, you're used to types. If you look at statements and expression in programming languages or formal logical systems or in natural language, sentences and phrases, you form them using rules of grammar or syntax from simpler ones. Okay, so the real rules of syntax are determined purely by types of speech. So for instance, in English, you can always put an adjective before a noun and get a valid verb. It doesn't matter if you had a rule for each specific adjective and each specific noun, your grammar would be bigger than your vocabulary. So it only depends on the type. So in natural languages and also simple type systems and first order logic, set of types is fixed. You have very uh, few. So you now don't invent a new part of speech for English. New words are introduced into English all the time. But new part of speech I don't think has been introduced for many centuries now. Uh, so set of types is fixed, but in most programming languages and in higher order logic, you have rules for forming types. Okay, so this is a sort of higher forming grammar. Okay, so you can form function types. I'll, I'll skip through these. The most obvious one is functions, products. We can form disjoint unions. And more generally, if you know Haskell or Scala or OCaml or something, you're used to these inductive types. These are generated. If you don't know them, you can please ignore this. But dependent type languages, none of which is used in production yet, go one level further. In this case, types themselves are first class. So Idris is the first language that might go into production, if any of you have heard of this, which is a dependently typed language. Ordinarily, a type is not first class in the sense it cannot, you cannot take a function which takes a type and an integer and gives you another type. So but dependent type theories are first class. Types are first class. So for instance, you can have a type of vectors of length n of natural numbers. Okay. So types have themselves universes. But since I'm short of time, let me just uh, say briefly that key discovery from the 50s is that in dependent type theory, you can represent logic in terms of types. And what I did was a baby version of that. Okay. Uh, so this is some details of these. I can, uh, I will simply skip all the details. So because you can represent things in terms of uh, logic in terms of types, you can use type theory instead of set theory as foundations for mathematics. This is what this homotopy type theory that I mentioned. Uh, and so this is work I'm doing. Let me just show one slide for a moment and then go to the concluding slide. Uh, so I have, uh, I work on my own. I don't have a lab effectively. And on, as I said, not particularly powerful computers. I've been very fortunate to have had some completely voluntary contributors though. Sayantan was an undergraduate here. So in his first summer, he has just graduated. In his first summer, he worked with me. The other three, two of all three I had never met before they got involved. Tomo visited me in summer in a joint program with IISC from JAST in Japan. Dimitro Mitin and Olivia Roland I have never met, and but Dimitro Mitin's contribution has been absolutely crucial to this. He's an assistant professor of computer science in Ukraine. So he just saw the thing on GitHub and uh, dabbled with it and wrote to me at some point. And as I said, his contribution has been absolutely crucial. Okay, So I've implemented homotopy type theory. And let me give you just a couple of uh, issues that I've done and we'll just conclude here. So here is the key point here. The theorem with us, so what do we do? So a theorem with a simple statement, but difficult proof is useful. Okay, if nothing else, because if a theorem is important, but has an easy enough proof, don't bother to remember the proof. You should be capable of discovering it when you use the theorem. Okay, so if it's a theorem is nice, but the proof is hard, then it's worth remembering the proof. Okay, also a theorem used to prove many other theorems is useful. And in case of applications, you may have externally determined usually. So the key point is with homotopy type theory and machine learning techniques, all these can be naturally captured. And you can also try to capture relations between mathematical objects. And this is what I've been working on doing. Um, so I will not tell you the details of how I capture it. 
okay it's essentially a, a reinforcement learning thing approach and <coughs> okay so these are details of how you uh, do things and how one can do it other thing i've done is used the lean theorem prover to generate code for myself again i will skip this these are technical things and a larger goal of mine which uh, maybe i'll end with a little uh, i've only done a small part of it is to when i talk about capabilities that are required to do mathematics one of the most important one is to read a textbook or a paper in mathematics and so this means extracts from the human literature which is of course where most of mathematics lies so one wants to use nlp tools for doing this i had a little demo here but which is only doing a small part of it so let me just skip that so this is a translation problem so i won't go into details of how i do it so instead of that since my time is out let me just conclude what is it i will do so systems such as alpha go zero and i avidly follow all these that happen are show that computers can learn to make judgments be original etc okay just two three weeks ago i read about the something called gqn generative query network also coming out of deep mind which has a key philosophical thing in common with what i i was doing okay so the case i know so these systems show computers are powerful and not only do they show they are powerful they show you how you do things even at the most basic level like make objective measures in addition to deeper levels of how you do things so you can hope that computers acquire a succession of mathematical capabilities so what do you do with those capabilities first step is to expand the range of ways in which computers can help in mathematics already this polymath was an unusual use of computers in mathematics we can hope there are more and more uh, ways in which you can do that beyond that uh, once you have more capabilities one of the things that is if you do mathematics and then you deal with software you realize how primitive tooling is for mathematics in particular the search that you would use whether it's mathsinet or google scholar or whatever else is a textual search not a semantic search and this is something that in the by software standard should be considered utterly primitive the semantic tooling is something that uh, or even a partial understanding of how computers can do mathematics can be used to do to a very significant extent okay and finally if and when you actually have really powerful tool uh, this is the general ai question what happens if computers become smarter than humans i'll briefly say then we can try to tackle harder mathematical problems than we can today okay which are useful in other fields like you know okay so with that i will conclude thanks